Good evening, everyone. We'd like to uh, thank you very much for coming. We'd like to call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock. And if you can all please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh, we got, oh. No, we got to do the agenda first. Oh, oh sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm still agenda. noting. It's okay. I move to adopt the agenda as presented. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Now. Motion carries three to zero. Can everybody stand and please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, I'd like a motion to um, Okay, we need a, approval for the minutes for our last board meeting, which was May, March 20th, 2024. So I move to approve the meeting from the March 20th, 2024 board meeting as presented. I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I'm going to abstain since I was not here. Okay. All Motion right. Carries Motion carries. Three zero. Four zero. Three zero one. Three zero. Three oh, zero, zero one abstention. Right. Okay. We'll get there. We're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> we got it. All right. Okay, Superintendent report. Thank you, Mr. President. A lot of things happen. It's that time of year where there's lots of celebrations going on. So uh, we're we're recognizing uh, staff members and students. Uh, we're going to go through a few of these at the middle school. Uh, eighth grade student Victoria Till placed second out of 781 entries for the 2024 Character Counts essay contest. And Devonte Watson, an eighth grader, was named to the boys' flag football all-star teams. Uh, the CHS choir uh, received a rating of excellent at uh, the state choir uh, festival. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Duplissis and uh, um, HR had a very successful job fair. We ran it, uh, had approximately 30 candidates show up and, and uh, were able to hire about eight people out of it, four teachers and four uh, staff members, or uh, support staff. Uh, if you were not aware, uh, Dr. Peterson, who has his office down by um, the McDonald's and, and uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and CTA worked together to have a spring festival uh, last week, and uh, it was an outstanding event. It was a little chilly out there. The rain came and the wind came for a while, but uh, they kind of tracked it, and over um, a thousand community members came out to it um, and had a chance to experience it. Uh, a lot of the kids really uh, enjoyed enjoyed some of the games that were that were there, and so it was a very successful uh, activity. Harmon's got a similar type of a community event happening on the 17th from 4:30 to 6:30. I believe that's a Wednesday. Um, and they're working with Pinal County uh, Sheriff's Office and some other local vendors and business similar to what uh, CTA did, uh, just as a way to go ahead and do community events uh, and let everybody see what's uh, taking place. Uh, Krista Claypool did a, a, a presentation for virtual patients and team-based learning on a webinar recently. Um, uh, LG Solutions, the governor and uh, the head of Arizona Commerce, Commu uh, Commerce uh, Committee was at, at the CPAC for a meeting with uh, LG uh, representatives. Uh, it was kind of a really uh, introduction and uh, the, the typical putting a shovel in the ground and throwing some dirt even though the building is going up out there. They still took that opportunity to, to do that. Um, and there was uh, multiple um, LG dignitaries from, from the company that were, that were there. Uh, they were very impressed with our facility and they're looking to rent it for some other events that are coming up here in the, in the near f uh, future. Um, our Roadrunners uh, enjoyed um, an opera, uh, opportunity to opera under, uh, over at uh, Ranch uh, with a student assembly. Um, across the district we have uh, um, uh, Battle of the Books that's taking place. They also had in the 2024 20, Character Counts essay contest uh, a first place winner in a uh, Adeline Martinez and a third place winner in uh, Tatiana Yanez. Um, so just exciting things happening there. Uh, we awarded 
a number of awards for the Combs Education Foundation for teacher grants, and one of those went to Kelsey Saint at Symington, and with her money, she was able to go ahead and create the science, dare, science estate science fair projects, and we had a number of students that went down there and, and were very, very successful um, with, uh, with that uh, uh, event. We're hoping to expand that across the district in, in the future, um, but it was, a, it was a great start. FCCLA State Leadership Conference took place, and the students came back with uh, one gold, three silvers, and one bronze. The yearbook uh, placed eighth at the Nationals. That was in Kansas City in the last week with uh, their yearbook, Don't Change, Evolve. Um, and so you just see there's lots of positive things that are happening across the district. Um, and it's that time of year where we get to celebrate. And we will continue to celebrate our, our staff and our students. Okay, you want me to just go into the next portion of it? Yep. Okay. Uh, as you know, this time of year we also celebrate, uh, or throughout the year we celebrate uh, individuals. Uh, based on uh, a special day or a special week or a special month uh, that are on the calendar. So we have a number of them we want to recognize. The first group I'd like to call up are, I'll have them come up and then I'll read a little something, but our assistant principals, Mike Griffith. <laughs> Carl Hill. And April Kajinski. The week of April 1st through the 5th is National Assistant Principals Week in this country. And again, these are uh, some behind the scenes, in front of the scenes individuals that help make a difference for our kids. Um, they put in a uh, tireless number of hours in terms of the job they do, sometimes not always seen, but there are all the events, whether they're sporting events, whether they're fine arts events. Uh, they're building the schedules, uh, they're working on registration, and so it's a lot of work that's behind the scenes that you don't always see. And uh, so it's a chance for us to say thank you for all they do, and I know there's any number of students in the, um, in the audience that, that know and appreciate uh, what they have done for them. In addition, we just found out, so we'll make the big announcement here and then put some other stuff out. Mr. Griffin was just named by the AIA as the 4A Athletic Director of the Year this week. So. We also have uh, National School Paraprofessionals Day on, Oct on April 3rd, so I would ask the following individuals uh, to please come up. Uh, Caitlin Dean from Ellsworth. <laughs> Erica Bejarano from Harmon. <laughs> Allison Jensen from Ranch. Jenny Ortiz from Combs Middle School. <laughs> Elizette Sanchez from Symington. <laughs> and Kim Taub from the high school. <laughs> and again, these, these individuals work one-on-one -on -one with so many students, and I, I was down at Ellsworth today. And uh, as I was driving up, uh, all the little kids were out on the preschool playground. And they have a little track, and the kids were riding their bikes around the little track. And there was an aide that was taking a kid that couldn't, wasn't big enough to ride the bike. And she was pedaling for him, so that he got to go around the track just like all the other kids that wanted to go around the track. And I tell that story because that's the type of thing that these people do. The way they work with individuals one-on-one, -on -one and, and, and those kids, in many cases special needs kids, and the, the love and compassion they give on a daily basis to these kids to make sure that they have the same opportunities as every other child in our district and they have an opportunity to shine. That's what they do. And you don't always see it because they're in the classroom and they're just behind the scenes. But they make a positive difference in the lives of our students and we thank them so much for what they do every single day. Thank you. We also have uh, National Librarians Day. We're extending this to uh, both our uh, librarians as well as uh, individuals that uh, are not 
librarians, but run our librarians. So if I could, that national day is coming up on April 16th, so you have time to go out and, and get them something. Um, Laura Real from uh, Ellsworth. <laughs> Sandra Gagnon from Harmon. <laughs> Wendy Blackfeather from Ranch. <laughs> Kelly Edens from the middle school. Cheryl Tapia from CTA. <laughs> Teresa Witt from uh, Symington. <laughs> and Ann Matson from the high school. <laughs> Again, another group of individuals that's in a place every single day that's a safe haven for lots of kids, a chance for kids to learn about lots of different things, a chance for them to explore uh, areas of interest, a chance for them to work on assignments that they need help with. Uh, and when you look at uh, a, li a library, um, there's many of us that that was the place that we couldn't wait to go to. And these ladies do an amazing job with our libraries. It's, it's difficult because the schools have had to cut back on librarians and so we have uh, library aides but they still do the same thing, which is create an environment for our kids to grow and an extension of the classroom. And for that, we're very, very appreciative of everything you do. So thank you so very much. Uh, the week of April 22nd through the 26th is our after school professionals. I am not sure if they're here because I know they work, they're taking care of things right now, but I'll announce and see if they are. Isabella Marshall. G uh, Jeannie Murphy and Roxana Ramos and again they run our they run our before and after school programs and so right now they're probably running our after school programs parents still waiting for parents to pick up their children um, they provide that opportunity for kids before and after school uh, in many cases, it's, it's, a, it's a help for our parents, but it also helps our kids in, in a thousand different ways. Um, and so we, again, are appreciative of all the little things, and a lot of times people don't realize just how many different people make a difference for your children in our system. So we thank them so very much. Now, on April 23rd, we also have Bus Driver Appreciation Day. So if we could have Karen Gillespie. John Mondak. <laughs> Brooklyn Heights Kitchen. <laughs> Ellie Avila. <laughs> and David Kelter. <laughs> Every, everybody sees the yellow buses on the road every single day. But if you stop and think about just how many buses hit the road in this country every single day, and to understand how many kids are moved around, and they're always moved around safely. The number of accidents is minuscule when you look at the number of kids that are moved, and that's because we have highly trained professionals that are driving these buses. They care about their kids, they care about getting their ki your kids to school and then home, and it happens every single day. You may see the yellow buses, but you don't know all they go through to make sure that the experience that your child has on their bus is, is an extra special um, event. And so we wanna thank them for what they do every single day because if they aren't there, your kids don't get to school and they, they don't have the experience. And so they're the first individuals that meet your kids every single day with a smile on their face and, ask, and, and welcoming them to their day. And so for that, we thank you for everything you do. And then on the 24th is Administrative Professionals Day. So th if you're not aware, these are the individuals that run the whole district. Um, you see them all the time, but they're the ones that are keeping the rest of us on our toes. So if we could have uh, Risha Evans from the high school. <laughs> Angelique Flores from the middle school. <laughs> Janet Harvey from Symington. Martha Mora Harmon. 
Debbie Merton's Ranch. Chrissy Ryder, Ellsworth. Shauna Scroggum, CTA. Darcine Kishpa in Food Service. Sabrina Stanley, Special Education. Priscilla Almanza, Community Ed. Danielle uh, Kirstetter, uh, HR and the receptionist of the district office. Nancy Shelley, district office. In many ways, these are the face of our school and our district office, and they're the ones that come in contact with many of you who call for different issues. Uh, they are uh, the voice you hear and the smile you see uh, every single time you go into that office. And so for that, we thank them. They do run the, the ship. They understand how the office is done, how the school is run. And I know our administrators could not do it without them uh, because they're the ones that are there to take care of so many different issues. Uh, again, just another group of people that you may not always notice, but are always there to make sure your children have a positive experience in our system. So we just want to thank them for everything they do. Thank you so very much. The next group we'd like to call up is the members of the CHS boys basketball team, and then I'll, I'll uh, say a couple words. Uh, let's see, we have Logan Tuckfield. <laughs> Jamin Amador. <laughs> Jay Luhan. <laughs> Jonathan Bias. Cameron DuBose. Solomon Brown, Daniel Washington, Justin Ford, Jackson Jones, Skylar Lawrence, Manager Glenn Dimes, Manager Daisy Martinez, Assistant Coach Dan Ziegler. <laughs> Assistant Coach Garen Brown. And Assistant Co or Head Coach Hosea Graham. Sorry, I'm gonna say a few things. So we wanted to recognize these young men and these coaches for the amazing season they had. It was a, a season that was very difficult, as we know, all know, very trying. Yet they were able to come through. They made the state playoffs. Logan was uh, uh, Arizona Republic, all Arizona boys, honorable mention, sports 360A, Z, boys basketball, uh, all academic first team. Uh, and they persevered you know, in a season that's unlike any other. And I think you forget that they're still young men. And to see what they did and the way they did it with the class and the grace that they exhibited was nothing short of amazing. At the same time, I wanted them up here as we recognize their head coach. And this is not a recognition for wins and losses. This is a recognition for a man who really exhibited what education's all about. For a man who took these young men and enveloped them and made sure that they were guided through one of the tougher periods of their life. A man that exemplified what it means to be an educator and what you hope you have in your life every single day. We have those people that make an impact in our lives. Coach Graham made an impact on so many people's lives in so many different ways, in a very quiet and unassuming way. And so although we recognize these boys too and the other coaches, we want to take a special moment to give what we do to, as, a, as appreciation, the blue apple to say, Thank you, Coach Graham. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for everything you've done. You made a world of difference in our lives, and we appreciate it tremendously.
principal and our AD and our school district, the amazing support that we had created a foundation of strength and courage. And the prayer that the prayers that this community offered up for us lift us up every day. And we are so grateful and thankful. I have been blessed to be able to coach and mentor and guide these young men. And we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you. So, Mr. Anderson, uh, come up for maintenance transportation as we recognize them for Blue Apple Street. Erica, unfortunately, is not feeling good today, her transportation supervisor, so she asked me to pitch you know, so Karen, come on up. She had some very nice words to say about Karen. She said, Karen is a special needs bus driver, classroom trainer, including the white fleet training for all coaches. Drivers go to her for direction and with any safety concerns, she is reliable, trustworthy, and a key member of the transportation staff. We're very proud that you're part of our team. And we have a special. Name drop. Name drop. Thank you. And the person in the maintenance department I'd like to recognize is Sean Moorhead. Sean? Sean, Sean is loved throughout this district. He is, he is exceptional. Um, he is the type of individual that only a lot of us can inspire to be. He's, he's always pleasant to be around. He always has a can-do attitude. He's always here to help you out and look out for the best interest of this district and the kids. And Sean, I'm very blessed that you get to work with me and I get to work with you, buddy. So thank you very much. And now we're ready for student of the month. Okay, we're now ready for student of the month. Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Wyman, colleagues and guests that are here this evening. As I say every month, uh, this is a great opportunity for me, best part of my day. Could I have Liliana Felix come up from the Combe Center for Success? Liana has demonstrated a dedication to finishing her classes, asking for help when needed, and a focus on graduation. She goes above and beyond helping others. Congratulations, Liliana, on a job well done. We are all very proud of you. Good job. <laughs> Could I have Angel Sosa come up from Combs High School? How about Madeline Toba from Combs Middle School? Yeah. 
This is Madeline. Madeline is a wonderful student at Combs Middle School, and she was nominated by several of her teachers. Mrs. Seavey said that I have Madeline in my ELA class and my CSS class. Madeline demonstrates trustworthiness by remaining accountable, arriving to class on time every day, and having respectful open communication when she needs help on a challenging subject. In addition, she's always willing to help other, other students while I'm assisting someone else. Madeline has always shown trustworthiness since she's been in my classroom. And again, that's from Mrs. Seavey. Congratulations, good job. <laughs> Could I have Jackie Scroggum come up from Combs Traditional Academy? Jackie has shown trustworthiness in technology by bringing a hardworking mentality to class. We can trust that she puts 100% effort into any task she's given, and she has a great attitude, and the other students look to her as a leader. That's the kind of good friend that we all want. Congratulations, Jackie. <laughs> Could I have Kay John? Stevenson come up from Ellsworth. Can you see the smile? All right, there it is. Kay John is a responsible and trustworthy student. He's honest, reliable, and helpful. Kay John follows our RISE code daily and models the expectations. He's not only trusted by his peers, but the staff alike. He enjoys assisting his classmates whenever needed and is always willing to help. Congratulations, Kay John. Good job. <laughs> Could I have Isabel Jordan come up from Harmon? How about Mr. Miles Rogers from Ranch? Where is Miles at? This is Jenny Curtis with Miles, Mr. Miles, my new buddy. He was nominated as a student of the month because Miles is always honest, he's kind, and does the right thing. Even when no one is watching, Miles follows the rules and helps his friends follow the rules too. He takes care of things in the classroom and remembers to always clean up. If Miles finds something that does not belong to him, he will give it to the teacher without even being asked. He's a great example to his peers and we're all very proud of Miles. Congratulations, Miles. <laughs> that was Miles. How about Elsie Hollowell from Symington? Well, that, con that concludes our students of the month. We're gonna take a couple moments of a break and if, if anybody wants pictures, you can do that and then we'll continue with the board meeting. Thank you. Is it just me or does it get warm in here? It, it got warm like What's 10 that? minutes ago. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I think they'll get it.
So next we have any reports from governing board members? Nope. Nope. All right. All right, next, um, public comments. No public comment. All right. So next we have our consent, consent agenda. Any questions or comments on the qu consent agenda? I'll take a, a motion on the, the whole or individually. I no. have nothing. No, no questions. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. I just got to. All right. Okay, I move that we approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay, I have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All, uh, motion carries 5 0. I can't type and think at the same time. <laughs> All right, that brings us to um, 8.0. One, let me get down there. Okay, 8.1, discussion on po possible action to adjust rates on peer model preschool program tuition. And this was presented last month, a uh, discussion that says uh, we're right now lower than our surrounding districts, and so the recommendation would be to, to raise the rates to uh, 150 day, or $150 uh, starting next month for four-day week, and so unless there's any questions, I would recommend uh, approval as presented. No, next school year, I'm sorry. All right, so if there are no questions, I'll take a motion. I'll motion to approve the Education Young Children Peer Model Preschool Program tuition for 24-25 as presented. I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Vote passes. 5 All right, that takes us to 8.2. Um, discussion and consideration of approval of 24-25 uh, student growth stipend. Yes, as, as part of the budget negotiations or budget conversations with both CCC, our, our Combs Collaborative Committee, which is made up of employees as well as our leadership team, uh, we're going to be bringing to you recommendations over the next, we, we brought some stuff last month or last meeting with uh, health insurance and this, this meeting, we'll bring a bunch more next meeting. What a student growth stipend is, is it's, it's uh, uh, being done, it's been done for the last, I believe three years, two years for sure, but I believe three years in the district. And what it is, is, is we're funded on current year funding. So if our numbers were to go up in the district, we would get additional dollars next spring. So what the student growth stipend says is we set a target out there district-wide of a growth of 200 kids. If we receive that by the 100th day in comparison to last year's 100th day, we would go ahead and provide all employees um, with a 2% stipend. It's a one-time stipend for the year. It doesn't carry over into future years, so there's no harm in terms of the next year uh, uh, with the budget. Uh, obviously, uh, we would look at individuals depending on when they are hired and they would be prorated. If we do not hit the target, then we don't give the stipend. I believe it was three years ago or coming out of COVID, we hit the target, so everybody got it. The last couple years, we haven't hit it. So it it's really doesn't hurt us, uh, both for long-term planning as well as, uh, uh, but, it's a, but it's a way to get everybody on the same page to say we need to work with student retention. Uh, and student recruitment, so it's uh, it's incentive based for uh, staff. Um, and again, you would have to approve. I know some of you aren't running uh, next year, so you wouldn't be there. But the board would have to approve the list of names in March before we distribute any money. So this would come back to the board uh, before we distribute money if we if we did it. Um, but because of uh, what we're trying to do in terms of recruitment and retention of students, uh, because of the positive it is for our our staff. I would recommend uh, approval of this uh, growth stipend as part of the budget recommendations and I'm more than happy to take any questions. Okay. I think it's a great idea. Anybody have any questions or comments? I think it's nope. a great idea. Yep. All right, so I'll take a motion. I motion to approve the one-time student growth stipend for all staff for the 24-25 as presented. All right, I'll second. Okay, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, vote passes 5 0. That takes us to our next section <clears throat> to 8.3 discussion and consideration of um, principal for ranch elementary. 
And we have an option of going to executive session if anybody would like to do that. I don't feel a oh, need I'm for that. Oh, I'm going. <laughs> I'm just teasing. <laughs> okay. I'm kidding. <laughs> All right. <Always> going. <laughs> All right. Before we go on, I'm, I'm going to read this. I just, okay. just want to make sure that you read I it. read this. <laughs> I think you okay. read it. Okay. The, go the governing board was in ongoing communication with the district ad administration regarding the hiring of the new principal at Ranch Elementary. The recruitment and hiring process that was utilized relative to the Ranch Elementary principal position is consistent with the recruitment and hiring process that the district has, had, has utilized for over a decade. That process includes screening. All applicants that are received are reviewed and candidates are selected to proceed to the, ne to the next step. Committee review, there is an initial interview of selected candidates by a committee, which determines three or four finalists for a second interview. Superintendent interview, finalists who are interviewed by the superintendent and assistant superintendent. Community forum, finalists participate in a community forum in which questions are asked of candidates and then candidates meet with the public. The public is provided an opportunity to provide feedback on the candidates. The emails, phone calls, and other feedback we have received regarding the process and the candidates selected or not selected as finalists are appreciated. Board members have had the opportunity to read and hear community feedback and we appreciate the time and effort that the district took in considering and presenting this finalist. So if, if there aren't any other questions. I'll Agreed, good job. <laughs> <laughs> so with that background, that makes my job easier. Uh, again, the process was, was uh, followed um, and we s came down uh, to two finalists, uh, oh, the overwhelming uh, individual that was recommended by staff as well as community coming out of the community forum was Mr. Peter Quinn, currently uh, uh, assistant principal over in the Cass Grand uh, Elementary School District. And so it's with a great deal of pride uh, that we would recommend to you for the new uh, principal at uh, Ranch Elementary. He has big shoes to fill, um, but we know that he can do it. Uh, would be Mr. Peter Quinn. So I would recommend approval as presented and after you make a vote, then he can speak, say a few words if you like. I'll make a motion to approve Peter Quinn as the principal of Ranch Elementary for the 24-25 school year. I'll second. All right, we have a first and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, aye. Vote passes 5-0. All right. Congratulations. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the staff and faculty of Ranch Elementary for your support and the opportunity to join your team. I would also like to thank the Ranch Elementary students, families, and community for speaking with and welcoming me during our public forum last week. I am honored and excited to join Ranch Elementary and the J.O. Comb School District. I look forward to supporting our mission as we continue to implement the systems Ms. Cruz and her team have established at this A-plus School of Excellence. Thank you. Thank you. All right, congratulations. Yes, congratulations. All right, that takes us to 9.1, discussion and information on student achievement. Good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Wyman, Ms. Wigner, and um, audience members. Um, we have a couple of updates to share with you. The first is around professional learning. So wanted to share with you from our March professional learning, um, starting with some qualitative data from the surveys that we give to our staff. The first one was around our campus Learn About It, which focused on the use of an AI tool to help them unpack a standard um, in their content area. And we chose to do that to offer a clarity partner for them because we know unpacking standards is a lot of work and sometimes it's difficult to go through that process. So their rating out of a scale of one to four, four being the highest, was 3.7 on their comfort using that information that they learned in that session. Our next phase of Learn About It's were some choice sessions where they had the same options, some of the same options we offered in January, and we had two additional new sessions around planning for small group instruction and using our Illuminate and FastBridge data. 
and their feedback on whether or not that was um, helpful for implementing their learning objectives was again a 3.7. Our workshop time, our practice at time, is where they actually get some work time to implement the things that they learned in the Learn About It. And overall, they felt like 92% of them felt like they could create something they could use with students. And those that did say a no, that 8%, were more around hoping for more time to plan with role-specific groups. So we're looking at making some adjustments for that for next year. And the last piece was the overall day how they felt like the learning was from that day, and it was also a 3.7. So we had some successful feedback. Uh, the qualitative feedback was more of that survey piece where they get to type in and their uh, more narrative answers. And so new ideas that they gained was, again, around AI and feeling like they were able to use that to kind of jumpstart their planning as a PLC. Uh, the workshop sessions, they really appreciate the collaboration over and over. We see more of this, more, more of this time. So really making sure that they have time to implement what they learned seems to be successful so far. The overall feedback was that they had those takeaways from AI and they were celebrating again that work time to actually come out with creating some, some plans. Um, areas of growth that they offered to us is more time to plan. We never have enough time for that. And again, those role-specific opportunities for them to have more of that collaboration. And if we move into the 24-25 planning, we are going to bring in Solution Tree, a representative from that team to support us with essentials for PLCs. We know we have those foundational pieces, but we really wanna shore up the PLC and the focus on data and instruction. So we have these different groups. We'll have representatives from those groups coming to that meeting. It's all day on the 28th. And then when we move into the July PL days, um, we still have some ESSERS money. So we're gonna have the three days. One day will be that work day like we did last year where it's an untouched day. And then the 12th and the 15th will be professional learning. Uh, we'll have one day probably at the high school where we do that collaborative learning and then move into some campus time so they can really dig into those PLCs and then continuing that work for the, the remaining three professional learning days next year. So what questions might you have around professional learning? I want to use an analogy, kind of a sports analogy. You can only watch film for so long, right? Mm -hmm. So I love that you're taking the time and you're stopping and thinking, are we giving them time to implement and to collaborate because we can only train the kids so much or the students or our teachers so much before they need time to implement. So keep that in the back of your mind. Your teachers are going to appreciate to say, you put the effort to give me stuff, let me try and implement it because by the time I hit the classroom, they're going to lose probably most of what you gave them. So give them that time to plan after you've given them such, you put your heart on the table as a district, let them reciprocate it and let them, let them jump in and be able to plan and put it into practice keep that in the back of your mind. Absolutely. I think it'll always be appreciated. Yeah, thank you. Good job. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, and we'll move into the state and federal programs with Ms. Hayam. Good evening. Um, tonight we're gonna do a few updates on some of our programs that we are um, currently looking at using and some we are applying for in the next um, school year. So one of the new grants that we have applied for is the, called the 21st Century Learning Grant. So this has been applied for at three of our schools. Um, and what this grant does um, is provide up to $120,000 worth of funding um, per year for three years. And then at, at 75% funded the following two years. So at $90,000 for the second two years. Um, and there's the key components that the grant really addresses. So academics in the way of tutoring or after school, before school, time, um, involving community partners and what they call youth development. So it's looking at clubs, activities and things for the students as well as their families and how we can bring families in and what can we do to engage them in the school community. So um, it also provides for each of those sites to have some summer programming um, at their site with their own students and their own teachers, hopefully, um, during that summertime. So um, it is um, a very competitive grant. We have applied, like I said, for three schools. Those would be Symington, Harmon, and mm -hmm. Ellsworth. They um, all have a little bit unique uh, twist on their, their clubs and some different things, but overall they're all looking to really engage their community um, and work with students 
um, in those intervention times as well as in those youth development times. So we will hear back um, in the beginning, hopefully of June, end of June, um, and that would start July 1st if we are awarded that grant. Um, so we are, we are anxiously awaiting and very hopeful um, for that. So I have a question. What, yeah. what, um, what, what, how did you pick those schools? So there's certain criteria that you have to meet. And the first one is that you have to meet the 40% free and reduced lunch threshold. Okay. So right there, that takes some of our schools um, that are not eligible. And so then we really spent time talking with leaders on those campuses as to what um, their needs were and would you be interested in supporting the grant. It is a heavy lift at the site level. They do have to hire a site coordinator. And because it's federally funded, there is a lot of paperwork and things that go with it, but the benefit um, that can happen for our kids is very great. So um, those were the sites that had things in the works that they wanted to continue to improve. Um, and so we went with that. Along with the free and reduced lunch, they also consider academic performance um, and things like our location to a rural or su um, suburb community. So all of those are weighted in the application. Um, so again, it, it was just a decision, number one, the free and reduced lunch count, and then who would be willing to support the work for the next five years. I know the high school had it before, and that's how yeah. they did the tutoring and the, and the busing, so. Yeah. And we are looking, um, it looks as though all of our schools will qualify for Title I next year. So that will open up some doors in terms of application ability for some other schools in the future. Absolutely. Um, and then we have the Art Consumable Grant. And when we applied for that in December, you were asked, um, you asked us to give an update as to what oh, yeah, was yes, going yes. So with that. So um, this, this grant has been a little challenging in that it was paused for a while by the state. And so we actually hadn't received um, the funding until just this April. So we have everyone's orders ready to go. Um, and now that we have received the funding, we're going to submit those. Um, but it's very exciting to see how the teachers are um, planning to use these materials. One of the things they have to do is provide a little narrative on how those will be used in their classroom. So um, currently we have photography and ceramics materials primarily at that high school level where they have some of those classes. A lot of items for drama and play production. Um, we have a lot of preschool um, teachers because the grant is preschool through third grade really working on bringing some themes and things alive in their classroom, incorporating science and social studies into their learning, and then lots of paints and sketchbooks and, and all kinds of things for kids to um, really involve and show um, what they know in their learning. So those will be purchased soon and hopefully delivered soon um, now that the funding has actually gone through. So it did take a little bit of time, unfortunately. And for next year, um, some of the grant opportunities that we are looking at currently. So there is an SEI grant that provides funding for teachers of our ELL students. So we are applying for that. Um, it is due May 1st. We are also looking to reapply for the targeted support and improvement grant. We currently have that grant supporting five of our schools and we are eligible again to apply for that. So we will be doing that. This one specifically targets um, populations such as our students with disabilities and our ELL students and helping them to reach the academic achievement levels of their peers. Um, and then we are currently working um, through the homeless and a mini grant that we received, purchasing those materials, working on setting up some community resources through that. And we are also exploring the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. There are several um, very competitive and specific grants that they have available there, but we are looking to apply for a couple of those that we might be eligible for. Um, as well as right now, we are creating that budget for next year. That is, again, due May 1st. Um, and we are currently awaiting information on our migrant education program for next year, but anticipate that award to be given to us pretty soon um, in the next few days. Any questions on the federal program so far? Yes, um, yeah. when you say we are applying, who actually in the district is doing the paperwork? You Me. Are? Okay. <laughs> Me. Um, it's actually a group effort, I will say that, because um, there's a lot of collaboration. So like with the 21st Century Grant, I met with the principals, they provided some input. Um, I wouldn't have known all the things about their schools um, that they wanted to use funding for without that. Um, I often ask my team, um, or I look back in some of the other things, um, and we've talked a lot about what we would like to do moving into next year. So as the principals are currently creating their needs assessments, then those are also driving some of those grants that I'm looking for and trying to apply and information that I can put into them. Yep. 
Any other questions? Okay. So um, in the future, we are going to bring to you next month an update on Experience Core, um, the tutoring program through AARP that has been implemented at Ellsworth. Um, some information on the curriculum adoptions, um, some summer school updates and some assessment updates. We are currently in the midst of state testing. And so that finishes at the end of the month. So um, we won't have official information until later, but we will have some updates. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, is that it? <clears throat> okay, that takes us to 9.2, discussion information regarding proposed K-8 general music, physical education, and technology curriculum adoption. <clears throat> All right, good evening, Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Wyman and Ms. Wagner. Um, so an update here for you on our curriculum adoption process for this year. Um, we got to do a little lighter lift this year, which was great, um, and utilize some of our remaining ESSERS funds to look at our, our technology um, music and physical education classes in the K-8 realm. Primarily our K-6 with the PE goes into that eighth grade piece. If you remember back a year ago, we made an expansion of the elementary special schedule, and so this kind of complements that to bring some curriculum into play. Um, this is one of the areas that we sometimes struggle um, with staffing on, because uh, it's challenging to come in and not have the right materials, so we're trying to make sure that we have that in place. Not only is this great for our kids because they love these opportunities to take those breaks in their day, um, but it's also great for our teachers because this is often when they get their, their planning time, so. All right, uh, so just a reminder that these are some of the elements that we look for in our curriculum adoptions. And this is our adoption schedule. We uh, ideally would be on an eight-year adoption cycle. Uh, we did succeed with that for math. Um, these electives pieces, we have a little bit more limited funding this year, so we're probably looking more at a five-year piece. Um, I'll share that at next month's board meeting. Uh, these are the folks who served on the adoption committee, so representatives from each of the campuses and these three areas. Um, our process began back in November. Um, we've been a part of a curriculum adoption process before. There are some timelines we have to meet, so it starts very early in the game. Um, and getting together and creating that vision for what the teachers want. Um, they develop a rubric then that helps to guide their process. Um, we do it as a three-tier approach in our district of things that we must have, things that are nice to have, and the bonuses are the cherry on top. And so we create our rubric accordingly, and we have an example here for you to see. So um, here's the, the music materials adoption. You can see that things like being aligned to standards and having age-appropriate student resources are some of those must-haves. Um, we get into the nice-to-haves if it's compatible with Google and some of those types of pieces. Um, some similar elements you'll see here in the PE rubric, um, things that they were looking for that they thought they really needed to have. Um, and then finally, the technology piece and some of their cr most critical elements. We then move forward once we have that in place and we, um, through the finance office, we work with Karen Finn to get out bids um, to vendors. We share with them our rubric on the front end. It works best that way because then they know exactly what we're looking for. Sometimes they self-select out because they can't meet our needs. Folks send in those materials to tell us um, that they would like to have their materials reviewed and we go through that uh, review process which happened um, over the course of those couple months, primarily in February. And then we invited um, some folks in that we wanted to hear some more from. So they, they selected using that rubric, these folks. Um, so we had a couple come in for physical education, Spark and Quaver physical education. We had Quaver Music and um, I Ready Curriculum Associates um, Learning.com um, was the other one. That one's for the technology piece. So we did those vendor presentations and they scored those out and made their recommendations of three finalists. So that's Quaver for general music, um, Spark for physical education, and Learning.com um, for the, the digital literacy technology piece. So those materials are now on display as per our regular process, um, and they're open for community um, input. Uh, we work with the uh, with Kayla's office to get out information on that, so that's being posted on the website so that we can go through the review process. So these are our finalists. They're up for public review right now. We'll come back to you in the future, pending, pending anything in the public review that they tell us that they have concerns or don't like it. These are all pretty straightforward, innocuous 
fund things for, for in music and technology um, and, and physical education. Um, but pending that, we'll bring that back to you for approval down the road. So any questions on the adoption? Yes, um, mm -hmm. for the public review, where is the material located so the public can go and yep. see it? So these are digital, so we'll, we'll put it out both as a digital access resource. We also, you'll, if you notice when you walk in the front desk, there's a computer set up with information on it. Uh, there's multiple browser windows so they can check out each of these resources. Um, these are all, these three are all pretty readily available um, via the internet as well because they're, they're digital resources. Um, with each of these, uh, excuse me, not with each of these, but with the general music and the physical education, um, part of the recommendation will be towards the curriculum itself and part of that is some uh, materials that will support that. So we want to make sure that we don't just adopt a, a PE curriculum and say, here's this great curriculum, now you don't have any of the stuff to actually do it. Um, so we've invested some funds for that as well. Um, and the teachers are working on putting a list together that would complement that so we know we've got materials for kids. Um, same thing in music. The literacy, we have the majority of it already in our technology adoptions. All right, we'll be back with that next month. Thank you. All right, that takes 9.3, District Instructional Time Model for 2024-2025. Mr. President, members of the board, Dr. Wyman, Mrs. Wenger, and community. Today I am here to talk to you with our first public hearing about our instructional time model that we will be presenting again at the next board meeting and then also asking you to vote on at that time. As we're talking about budgets and looking at next year and how we can improve our current funding sources, there are ways that we can do that and one of those ways is by implementing the instructional time model. The instructional time model allows districts throughout the state to provide instructional opportunities outside of the confines of the school, um, typical school schedule. Some of these approaches are not new to us, such as makeup work, while others are, are newer and more innovative, such as project-based learning and mastery-based learning pieces. In addition to, ooh, I did not move that, did I? Okay. With the purpose of the um, instructional time model, first we're really looking at, this came about from, originally from the pandemic. Our state legislature allows school districts at that time to um, be able to apply for the instructional time model, which provides opportunities for when students were out, that they were still able to make up that work and then be able to be uh, named as present during that school day. Um, Within our Arizona revised statute, the, that language, it talks about that flexibility and meeting that instructional time and then instructional hours through alternative models. The one thing I do wanna state is that this is not based on remote learning. This is our brick and mortar on campus students. We already have another, we have our online program for our students that want that flexibility completely with online, but this is specifically for an opportunity for our students that are here brick and mortar within our school buildings. We talked about this with our CCC and our leadership team as part of our budget priorities. We looked at um, focusing these changes with the instructional time model and including an attendance campaign that really highlights the importance of attendance. Within our, within our rationale, one of the pieces that we're look, we looked at was our first reason was that increased instructional time. What does that look like? For us, what changes, um, how do we align with our hashtag forward outside of the school day? In addition to meeting the learning needs of all students, how can we incorporate some of the mastery-based, project-based learning pieces? I know Mrs. Tucker had talked about PE and how are we able to provide credit. This is an opportunity for us to do exactly that, be able to apply the, uh, that time spent outside of the classroom towards that mastery base, that competency-based piece, and be able to apply it towards credit within that classroom piece. So again, it's giving us that innovative um, outside of the typical school day. And then just third, uh, our third reason is really looking at our district revenue. We currently are looking at about 25% average of chronically absent students. What that means, chronically absent, means that it's 10% of the school day, so about 18 or more days. We're currently at about 25% average for our school district, and we're hoping this will um, align with that and be one of the components that we can increase that um, 
increase that school attendance piece and specifically with looking at, uh, as since with the pandemic, we've had some of our parents that want more of that flexibility since that time. Can I ask a question? Absolutely. Sorry, I got a question. Um, when you said 25% of all of the students in our district have 18 average. or more so days out. Fourth of our kids are not showing up to school. For 18 or more days. 18 or more days. <laughs> and it, this is and not unique to our district. Not at it, all. It's an issue so, that's happening across the country. So why? 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 Do so, we know why kids are just not coming to school? It, some of it is that flexibility piece in, in talking with different parents. And um, even I was talking with Dr. Fountain today, even friends of mine. Since the pandemic, it's been a lot easier for some families and some parents to say, okay, if a kid wants to stay home, that they're oh, able man. to stay home when they're not really feeling well or for a couple of days. Or even if something comes up, we have some students that do club ball and they miss out with that. So there's different, um, there's different areas of absences that we're, we're looking at and seeing how we can still incorporate and bring back those pieces. It is so truly the, a... Uh, right. So Dr. Wyman, you believe sorry. that this 25% of kids that aren't showing up, the effort that we're going to put in is going to be a good bang for a buck? I mean, are these kids actually going to say, I've missed school, now I'm going to make up the work? Is that what we think is going to happen? Well, well that's what we're going to work with parents to get it happen. So, so as an example, you, first of all, I think you have to look into the data, and, and Dr. Fountain and I were talking about it today. Are you talking about, you know, a lot of times you go to solve a problem and you think the problem is, is this issue. And with everything you got, you can incentivize it. A lot of people in the past that say, hey, we'll give you perfect attendance awards. What that really does is award the kids that are already perfectly attending. Already and perfect. so, but the kids that aren't, don't. Yeah. So we're trying a different way to, to work with, with families. Uh, and it's, it's new, it's being used. I know uh, uh, Ms. Scott has done it in another district. <clears throat> but it's a chance to do, let's just say there's a, a situation, let's not make it a negative, that <clears throat> we have to go on a family outing for a reason. Maybe there's a, a, a wedding or something and they're going to be gone. But they're going to go somewhere and as part of this process, they're going to go visit a particular site. You could set up work ahead of time with them that they could go ahead and go to, the, while they're at that, at that particular city, they could go ahead and visit some historical sites, they could write a reflection piece on it, submit the reflection piece on it, and you could count them absent. So the, dis the issue, count, I mean, present. count them present, excuse me. Present. The issue is wow. that just like when I was in school, you did the makeup work. So that's not changing. The difference is we can use technology to do the makeup work a little bit different. The difference is they will now count them as present, not absent, if they do this work. So I don't know if it's going to happen, but right now we're not getting anything out of it. If we get 3%, we're better off than we were this year. We would hope that we would ch change and reduce the absentee rate by significantly more than that. And so that's what we're trying to. But it's going to take a communication issue with the community and with our families. It's not just, hey, we're doing this. It's our teachers. It's everybody having a communication. So this, the reason we're having this conversation now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is because it's going to take a full-blown effort by the time July rolls around to make sure everybody understands what this is but it's allowed under the law, it's different, why not give kids that opportunity and families that opportunity to, to make up this work? Because um, right now, um, the, the absentee rate, and again, we have people, I think uh, both Ms. Scott and myself are, in, are on a, uh, a webinar that's coming up and there's some other people. This is a national problem. This webinar is for school districts across the entire country that are talking about how do we resolve this issue and this is an uh, availability of a statute that allows us to do something unique and different to take care of the issue. And uh, we would hope if, if we're saying 100% fix by first year, no, it's not going to happen. But maybe the first year we're this much, and then the next year we're a little bit more, and we continue to build on what we're offering. And so we would hope that, yes, it would make a significant difference. If I take it as a negative message, Bob, I'm telling you, you can be absent. Just make up the work. I'm taking a negative, negative aspect to it, right? Mm -hmm. If our absences start to increase, then that would be a problem, right? Yeah. Then we're just saying, hey, we're actually dumbing down the curriculum for the way that maybe we're presenting it. I'll just write right. a reflection. I know you're not right. saying it that way. Right. I'm just trying to take it in a negative way right. for it just to, to anticipate maybe problems. Because if you're telling me I can just be absent right. and I'll just do some makeup work, we're going to see an increase in in absences, which is going to 
make the problem even worse. Right. So there's still parameters. We're meeting with all of our stakeholders, including teachers, leadership, after hopefully this passes, after that happens, and creating specific parameters so as that is not the case. We don't want this to be a free-for-all, right? Because right. again, when students are not here, they're missing out on integral pieces, correct? We want to be able to still have that opportunity, but there's also times that there are family emergencies, whether it's a death in the family or something happens. And they're, and they're rare. They're, you know, that's, 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 yes. I don't think we're talking 25% kids on you know family emergencies. I don't right. think that's what we're talking about, right? But I mean, if you're it, gone for honest, two weeks and then you show up like, oh, we just didn't want to come to school, well, is that someone that can just say, oh, we'll just do some makeup work? Or not, not no, you talk to us before and say, hey, we're going to be out. This happened. Right. Right. What do we do to make it up? Let's work with you. Right. And remember, if they're out for a significant amount of time for over 10 days and they haven't communicated with us, we still legally have to drop students at right. that point. Right. So again, that that is not the purpose right. of this. Our purpose of this is really to provide kids still that opportunity and then also be able to look outside of the box at other pieces. Because the instructional time model, it gives us that opportunity within all of our courses at the high school pieces, some of the pieces at the elementary, at the middle school, so that it's not just that absence piece that is a, a big focus of it, but it also gives kids different opportunities. We have kids that um, do rodeo. We have kids that do club ball. They're gone quite a bit for those specific sporting Good events. Good idea what percentage of kids are absent so, for that reason. No, I, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we can't. I'd be interested in knowing the kids that took advantage of this, what other end result test scores and is there decline right. and, 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 and I think that I think the issue absolutely. that you're going to have right now, just so you're aware, is that this was approved in 21, 2021. 2021 at the legislature. But you have very few districts that, that saw it and, and kind of latched into it. Right now, this is being talked about across the state because of the attendance issue that's occurring, again, not just here, but everywhere. So you have districts across the state that are starting to look at this to say, what does this really mean? How does it look? Uh, Ms. Scott was at Cape Creek where they did it along with Deer Valley, Paradise Valley, Dysart, and Peoria. We're talking with them to say, okay, what's the model? What's, what, we're not gonna reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. What have you done to do this? Because they've had it for two years, one year? Two, and two well, years. Peoria is closed so, in three schools. I don't know if that's a good school. Right, right, <laughs> so. right. Not Peoria, Paradise Valley. Yes. Paradise Valley, yes. Yes, yes, you're yes right. they're, they're closed, yeah. Right. Peoria's no, growing. Right, <laughs> okay. Right, and, and there's, but there's, and, 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 but it's an issue because of any number of factors, including uh, absenteeism as well as declining enrollment. That declining enrollment is happening across the country, not just in Combs. And so we're, we're looking back to the issue that we talk about. Um, at the end of the day, if we don't figure out a way to create more revenue, and I'm going to turn this into a business proposition, if we don't sure, figure out sure. a way to create more revenue, then we're impacted even greater. And so we build our budget. When well, we're going to build our budget next year and we bring it to you and, and Mrs. Cook presents it, it is a pred predicated on the notion that we would have a normal group of kids showing up every day. If you don't have that occur, Hopefully we will not get understand. funded to that level, <laughs> and so now you have a, you, you've compounded the problem. So we can sit back and do nothing, or we can say, hey, here's a different and creative way. We don't have all the answers and won't have all the answers, but here's a different and creative way that we can go ahead and change the revenue projections for the district and keep them where they should be within the budget. Because if we don't, the impact is significant. Okay, I, a follow up question on that 25%. I'm still bad. How does it that. split between wow. elementary, middle, and high school? Do you have that data? I do. Yeah, it's just amazing. 25. How do you teachers teach in the classroom? They've got a. You knew I, also, I was going to ask you I that. Knew. Honestly, when, when you I talk also to a teacher prepared. that's got six kids out in their class, they can't teach. I yeah, think so. that it's also a society issue. I mean, now more than ever, most, most parents have to work. So if they're gone and your kid doesn't get on the bus, you're staying home. Yeah. It's, it, that's just how it is. So we can either say, okay, you're absent, or we can reach out to them and say, hey, guess what? We can do this now. And at least they're doing something. Okay. So our elementaries range from anywhere from 13% to 27%. Um, middle school to high school ranges from 28% to 33 Yep, there you go. Yeah. Okay, so the older kids, it's that. more of a problem. Yep. And a lot of times... That's because they're going to babysitters, I was just gonna say and they that. get they get them there. High, middle school and high school, they're supposed to get themselves there. And I don't know, I have 
my kids and I was getting them up. Hey, you're late. Get on it. You know, and if they were late, I took them. Yeah. But they, so, pe- parents these days don't have that luxury anymore. And they are, they miss the bus, they miss, they miss it. So, yeah. I mean, everyone, I think er, this is in society right now, everyone is struggling. And again, I think if we can be innovative and provide parents that flexibility and really look at our community and how can we help. We're going to have to do something. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I'm going to go to this, my last slide. Which Thank is you just for letting a, me interrupt, by the please, way. Please, not a problem. I'm just happy I was prepared for your question. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the components of the instructional time model. Now also I wanted to say that we were actually talking about this with the East Valley curriculum, that this is also these same conversations that Dr. Wyman's talking about are happening here in the East Valley also as to how they can look at it. And again, how we can incorporate that competency-based and mastery-based piece that you were talking about. Um, so the four components are we will define that instructional time model. What, what does it mean? What are, what's our approaches? And Dr. Fountain's gonna talk a little bit more about what that looks like. How, what will that time look like? And then how are we gonna be tracking attendance? That key piece is again, that tracking attendance and ensuring that we have right. the voice of all of our stakeholders as to what's going to work best, what's going to be efficient. And then also understanding that flexibility, like Dr. Wyman said, it might not work amazingly well, but hey, we're, we're trying. willing to listen, yeah. we're willing to I try, agree. and we want something innovative for our families. We're going to have to compete with ESA. 100%. For sure. yep. And as we are seeing more of the, the kids homeschooled and that right. flexibility, if we exactly. can provide some of that. I agree. Okay. You're up next. Hey, you guys. Are you listening? Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sidebar. It's great. They, you asked Nancy all the questions, so... Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that, to Mr. Beach's point, I mean, I think that with any intervention, and to me this is an intervention tool, with any intervention we're always having conversations about who is our audience. So staggering as that number may feel for those chronic absenteeism kids, this is not the answer for them. There's some other pieces we need to talk about to answer them. This is more for that middle of the road kid who on occasion misses a day and actually has that work ethic to, to chime in. Um, as we went through this process, <clears throat> I will say that uh, my own child was a great example of this. I had my oldest child was a, a high achiever in high school and several times throughout her high school career said to her mother and I, can I stay home today? I just need to get caught up because she was in theater and she was doing all these things and we begrudgingly said, okay. And she did, she genuinely stayed home and worked all day. She got her work done, She didn't get, the school didn't get credit for her being there. So. I think there are some nuances like that. Um, one of the things that we'll talk about when we take this back to the stakeholder group is what parameters do we want to put on to start? So this may be something as simple as saying, we cap it at three days. Like it doesn't have to be a free for all where we say, oh, you can have 100 days this year being home, right. but we can give a little bit of grace and flexibility and try it out and see if it helps our families. And if it doesn't, then we go a different direction. So, Mine uh, stayed home, they had to watch the History Channel. There you go. Um, so I can person. I can agree it's better than doing nothing. Yeah. They just from the if you look at tilting it the other way of now I've just thrown out hey you can be absent whenever you want and do makeup work. Right. I know that's not what you're intending to do. I no. know that's not it. Yeah. But I could see the message being received that way by For people sure. that are already chronically absent. For sure. Oh now I can just do makeup work. You know, yeah. but that's not what we're looking for. I understand that. Just. Right. And, and I it's assume it's still not baffling to me. It's going to be like the teachers are going to stand up and go. By the way, if you don't want to come to school. Like I think it'll be more, <laughs> more like when they're absent. We'll be handing out makeup work basis. at the end of the day if those don't want to come to school tomorrow. Yeah, no, that's not for sure. And yeah, I think those are you know those are those pieces where, you know, we talk about the relationship component in classrooms, right? Where you build those relationships with kids so that they want to be there every day, and this really becomes the exception to the rule, you know. And I think, in the heart of most of our educators, that's what they're all about. You know, um, I started my career as a middle school teacher, and we were a bunch of hooligan teachers. But you know what? Our kids didn't miss school because we had a good time and they didn't want to not be there. So, um, but these are some good flexible options. So um, just to continue on and reiterate a few of these pieces. So it looks at things like direct instruction, project-based learning, independent learning, or mastery-based learning. So it could be a project in lieu of. Um, some of our teachers already utilize some of those flipped classroom models that you might see in direct instruction. Um, for example, like I know at the high school, our high school math teachers 
had started doing some work where they were recording their lessons and kids were doing that as the homework and then they were doing the supported work in the classroom during the day. So this is a model where they would be able to watch that video at home and do the work, bring that in you know, as part of that process. I'm sure you've already thought of it. I'm sorry, I'm chiming in again. This it's all right. seems to touch my heart a little bit. Whatever you can do to lighten the load for the teachers, jump on it, whatever you can do, right? Because all of a sudden, I mean, you've been there, right? They show up, they're, they're leaving in a week. Oh, can you give us all the, the work for the week? Like, are, right. you, are you kidding me? You're not going to do it anyway. Yeah, right. <laughs> right? Or they come back and they want it. Like, no, they're not going to do it. So I, I lighten the load as much as you can for teachers. Keep that in mind, please. For sure. And, and, I, and just so you know, that's where I think the, the technology in the old days, all you could do is make paper to give to the kids that weren't there when they came back. They had to do the work. Then you had to grade the work. When you have stuff in Google Classroom right now, you have kids that can do the work the same day that the other kids in the class did the work, and therefore when you're doing the grading, it's all at one time with it. So the, the use of technology will make it easier for teachers. If I don't have to try to teach a kid because we have a swivel lesson and they can watch it or we've done it online, it just makes it easy. If we have paper and we have a documentation that they work with a paper tutor for, two, for an hour or something, you have ways that you can track it that are a lot different than it used to be where what you had is paper to give to them when they came back. They had to do the work and they had to come back. So we're hoping that. And keep I'll give you, keep the teachers another. involved. Yeah, just, sure. just talk to them. What's going on? What would be the easiest way for them to take care of it? And I'm sure you guys will come up with a fantastic solution. So yep, they will there. be a part of that. I, mean, I, think a good, <laughs> I think a good illustration and example of that would be to put in that piece of, you know, as I think about teacher frustrations, one of them is always that makeup work, right? And it trickling in throughout the semester. So again, as we build our plan, one of the parameters that we could put in place is that we could limit the amount of time. So you got you know 24 or 48 hours or whatever that is to get the work in, and you get a dual benefit. Not only do you get credit for the work, but you get credit for, you know you don't get that absence on there, and that might help incentivize kids to turn in that makeup work right away yes. instead of dragging their feet. So um, lots of things to consider. Um, these are some of the ways that we might be able to measure the time, because we have to measure the time um, and attendance. So through Google Classroom, um, some of our pieces automatically log students' attendance. That's part of what we do like through programs like Edgenuity. Um, teacher communication, the potential to zoom into a class. There's lots of different ways we can go about it. And again, the next step in the process is building that. Again, as Dr. Wyman mentioned, you know, really the most basic concept is that, that idea of makeup work and how can we do that in some flexible ways um, to give us some opportunities here. So um, part of the requirements here are the two public meetings. So we're starting with this month um, and then developing that instructional time model. So we have some work now to do with our stakeholders. Um, the next intention would be to bring back to you some of that framework with what we've talked about with the stakeholders and how this would actually look and work in our district. We just wanted to get started uh, this month. Um, so May board meeting will bring that back to you with the attendance plan. Uh, then we would need to submit to ADE for approval. And obviously we have some professional development to do around that to, to train folks. Well, I'm excited to hear about it actually. So looking I'm forward to it. Yeah, I, I think it's gonna be great. Whatever you come up with, it's gonna be great. So I'm excited. Any other questions, comments? Used them all on Nancy. I like it. She did well. You did well. <laughs> all right. And, and so you know, this presentation was given to CCC. And so the teachers on CCC have seen this, and we have, we've had a conversation. What I told them when we, we presented it was, out of fairness to them, we wanted to make sure they were aware of it before um, it came to the board as an initial meeting. It was also uh, talked with with uh, leadership teams. So this conversation is has been ongoing because the, the one of the driving priorities for this discussion on the budget was student attendance and the number of kids that are missing. And so that's why we even looked into this. And so uh, they had some very good questions, but I will tell you as a general rule for the teachers in the room for CCC, they were not against it. Um, uh, I think they were open to the uh, understanding that this may be another solution. So uh, it is being shared. Uh, we asked them to take it out to their to their sites to share. So this isn't gonna per se come as a surprise. We, we're trying to get the communication out, so, so just know that. All right, any other questions? Okay, that takes us to 9.4. I shared the last month's uh, uh, student uh, enrollment okay. numbers with you, and so I don't know if there are any questions or concerns, but if there are, um, this is the time that we can discuss. 
I don't have any questions. I've got it, but I have no questions. But thank you for getting that to us. I think it's very good information. Okay, 9.5 discussion information regarding the purchase of a van, new van for EBIT transportation. Yes, as part of our AGA with uh, EBIT, um, uh, there's a requirement that kids are transported in the morning and the afternoon. Uh, right now, we transport uh, all of our kids in the afternoon that, or not all of them, but the majority of kids in the afternoon that want to go. Some kids drive their own on their own in the morning. We have not transported kids in the morning because when you look at the, the schedule, it's uh, prohibitive within their schedule if they're gone all morning and by the time they get back to school, there's not a lot of hours left. Uh, as it is, you have to pick up a, an online class. If you take an EBIT, if you do it in the morning, um, you'd have to pick up two. At the same time, the agreement with, I, with EBIT says we're transporting both times. They have given us a waiver in the past for any number of reasons. I don't know the, all the historical basis for it. Um, we're the last district that uh, was given a waiver, and as of this year, they're saying no more waivers. And so we have to come up with a, a way to transport kids. Uh, in, the old, in, in probably pre-2018, uh, there was, uh, I don't know exact year, but there was an accident where uh, a college teams were, uh, students were killed in an accident in vans. And so they stopped the use of vans, 15 passenger, 11 to 15 passenger vans for any school district in Arizona. Uh, with coming back out of 2018 and into 2021, uh, quite frankly, in, in some cases, based on, on uh, charters not wanting to uh, purchase buses, they push through the legislature the ability to use vans again. So when we take a look at how we're going to transport these uh, kids, if we have them, uh, is it more cost effective to get a big bus? Is it more cost effective to get a mini bus? Or is it more cost effective to get vans? It's more cost effective to get vans. And since the law allows for that, um, I just want to bring it to your attention that we'll be coming back next week, or excuse me, next month. Uh, we'll be asking for approval for up to two vans. The reason for two vans is because you have uh, the downtown campus uh, for EVIT, which is off of Maine and I think Alma School, and then you have the power campus. And so the ability to get kids to both campuses is not necessary. We'll start with one and then see what the kids want. We don't necessarily have a ton of kids that want it again because it doesn't fit into their schedule. But that way, we're in compliance with the IGA um, because they're not going to waive that portion of it. Um, and so therefore, we're going to have to come up with a solution. The funding source for this, given that we talk about budgets, is out of CT money. Now, that will mean it, the vans will be restricted. Um, on a daily basis, it's restricted already because they'll be transporting kids to one of the sites. Um, but then on the weekends and stuff, if CT happens to have a field trip or a, a competition, then we can use the vans. But because the vans are going to be purchased out of CT funding and not M&O or capital, um, there will be limitations on, on other uh, entities using or other clubs using those vans. Um, like I said, we'll come back to you with one. And then depending on uh, uh, how it goes in terms of students signing up for, uh, for different courses, um, we may come back at a later time and say we need to not go out for a second one. Um, and it's just a way to, to, to go ahead and address a concern that's, that's arisen this year because the EVIT board has refused our waiver requests. Um, uh, I, I have two questions. Sure. Approximately, what is the cost of one of these vans? Not exactly, just ballpark. I'm going to assume neighborhood of 75000 um, is would be our, our ballpark. Uh, the second question would be, we're having trouble getting bus drivers. How right. do we get someone to drive this van? So the that's right. The, the one issue with a, with a van is you don't have to have a CDL. And so because you don't have to have a CDL, and, and that would be the other reason you could do the minibus, you don't need a CDL. But a minibus still runs 125, 145. So you're still significantly less than a, than a, a minibus. And so uh, you could have anybody that could go ahead and drive it. So it opens up the pool as to who could drive it. Obviously, we do background checks. We, we, they're still driving kids, and so they still have to go through all the stuff, but they don't need a CDL license. So that opens up the possibilities significantly. Thank you. I assume that EBIT does not have transportation um, funds that they get from the state? Uh, no. They don't have transportation funds. They do have other funds. Uh, we've gone back and forth for several meetings, including attorneys, um, and, and this is a, the, the best position we could get ourselves into, um, irrespective of any other issues. Huh. Can CT rent the buses out? Um, I, I, I don't believe so, but I'd ask that. I mean, no, Julie, okay. Is it, so once they're purchased by CT, that's it? 
forever and for always? Is there any? Only CTE can use them? Yes. Because it's coming out of yeah. CTE funds? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Can we get that baby wrapped like Tom's traditional? Like I'm talking yeah, about doing some get, we would have to pay some for advertising that. for us. Yeah. Um, but yes, we would ultimately, pop, if we get rid of it, we'd have to restore the funds back to the federal government. Yeah. What about the white buses that they use for sport for the sports teams? Yeah, we can use those um, uh, with. With the the amount of times we use those buses, the concern's been that are they going to be available every day to transport kids? Because once a kid gets a schedule, then we're going to have to transport them every day. And so if we were taking the white buses, as an example, on a Friday for a wrestling tournament somewhere, they wouldn't necessarily be available. So our thought process was if we could get dedicated ones, then we at least would know they would be available uh, on a daily basis to take the number of kids we need we need to take. So Girls we've looked at both. had to go on something, yeah. but they couldn't because they had to use the CTE they wouldn't be able to go to that game. Don't want that. <laughs> right. I, I, our issue right now is we don't have enough regular buses to transport the kids on a regular basis um, based on our number of drivers and our number of routes. And so that's why we're looking for alternatives because we don't have enough to go ahead and do it on a regular, on a regular ongoing basis. Um, and so we looked at the three options and felt this was the most e economical that would still allow the number of kids that actually want it because we don't, again, there's not a thousand kids out there saying I want a trip. It's a very small number. Uh, we anticipate it to be less than the 15, uh, but we're finishing up, um, uh, the, the high school's finishing up uh, uh, part of the uh, student schedules as we speak, so we don't know the exact So number. also they can't, they don't have to, if you use a regular bus, you have to get a bus driver. But with the minibus and the and the van, the coaches can drive them, so I, it's makes it a lot easier. I I, w I would assume. I know it did for cheer. All right. Okay. Any other questions on that? All right. Nine point six discussion and information regarding the 2024 twenty twenty four twenty twenty five. District promotional videos. Yes, uh, Kayla had a family emergency and had to step out, so I'm going to pinch it for her. Uh, what we've done uh, going on now for probably four or five months was uh, go ahead and, and take some uh, dollars uh, that are available to us to deal with issues. And this happened before all the conversations about uh, enrollment. So about, la about a year ago this time, maybe a year and a half ago this time, Kayla and I were talking about how do we go ahead and update some of the videos we have and how do we do some more videos to, to go ahead and do um, uh, marketing for uh, our district. Uh, in this particular case, we did not take this money out of m and uh, We purposely said we we're gonna take it out of our rooftop fees uh, because this is a one-time hit and we didn't. it's not a reoccurring expense, uh, but we felt it was important to have uh, updated videos of our, of our schools, which were released to you probably, I yeah, can't remember, it's the end of the fall or I the like beginning it. of the spring. Uh, at the same time, we also had five more uh, uh, videos that were for specific areas, uh, and those are being released as we speak, as well as there's five 30-second videos that are being released too. So in total, we end up uh, having a significant number of videos that are, that are available to us. We just wanted to share uh, in a public meeting a couple of the videos just so you can see the quality of these. So I believe we're sharing the district video and then the one that we use for recruitment. So we'll take a few minutes to watch this and then I can answer any questions. As a parent, what you want for your child more than anything else is for them to be prepared to be successful at the next step. And what we can guarantee you in our district is that's what exactly what will happen. Rather than trying to fit your student to our learning environment, we're trying to fit our learning environment to your student. So that means that we offer multiple pathways for student success. We offer students opportunities to differentiate their learning environment. And we really try to cater to what works for each individual student. The instructional model and the portrait of a graduate is really about youth development. Not only youth academic development, but youth social, emotional, behavioral skill development they can achieve to their highest levels, not only academically, but intrapersonally and interpersonally. 
Red. Okay, which one of the ways we prepare students for success is really looking at the whole child. I think that we are very fortunate to have a social worker and a counselor on our campus, and those individuals are able to provide some social emotional support to our students. We are really intentional in trying to evaluate students' needs and then provide them those supports. What I love about Combs is the small feel the support that we provide. Our desire is that they see us as working together to help their child have their best experience in learning. We're all just one giant team with the common purpose of helping each child be their best. My staff works so hard for every single student. They work tirelessly to find solutions to figure out how to bring out the best in every single student. I am a part of this community and I'm truly invested in this community and I believe in this community. I am a champion for this community. This is my community. I love the environment. I love the opportunity that I have to interact with students. I love my peers. Just making those students feel that they're loved, that they matter, that they, they belong. I love Combs High School because this is my community and I've always believed in investing in my community and so this is not only where I teach but this is where my kids go to school and I know they're getting the best education possible. We want to help prepare them for their college or career path of choice knowing that they're going to leave us with communication skills, the ability to collaborate, critical thinking, creativity, being able to adapt to an ever-changing global environment. Career and technical education has always been on the forefront of providing experiences for students to learn and learn best. We have 13 programs currently at the high school and it ranges from students who are in our stagecraft program. We have three medical programs. My youngest daughter, Chloe, being able to be a part of the medical assisting program, it has opened so many doors for her and has brought her out of her shell. She is thriving at her new job of employment and is excited to further her education with her associate's degree in medical assisting. I am grateful that Combs has these programs for our students and it gives them so much opportunity for the future right out of school. We have communication media technology courses. TV and film, digital communications, graphic design, and digital photo. So our students have an opportunity every year to compete at either the local or national level, and our students have done very well. We've had students travel across the country to receive recognition for some of the accomplishments that they made. Whether it's hashtag forward, whether it's the small groups we pull, no matter what it is, everything that we do revolves around getting our students to be as successful as possible when they leave us. It's about them. It's about where they're headed after high school, and we want to give them a competitive advantage for whatever it might be that they do in the future. Right, Comey, it has the accent. Combs High School does a good job of making sure they have teams, clubs, sports, opportunities for students to connect, and if we don't have an offering that a student feels like is a need on campus, we will talk with them about that and see about how to bring the opportunity forward. What are you going to have? It has a happy feeling, a, a family feeling, a friendly feeling where kids can come and be safe and learn. And when you watch kids and the amazing things that they do, it just makes it all worthwhile. I'm continually astounded by everything that our students do, how they rise to the occasion. We have something for every single family. And what we guarantee is that when your child leaves our system, they will be prepared for the next level. Uh, HR one that we can use when we're out on recruiting. So we'll show you that one and then we'll move on. The reason to choose Cone as much as anything else as you're choosing family. We're a, a smaller district, we're getting poised to grow, but family is still what we're all about. I have been working in the Combs District. This will be my 15th year here. I actually started student teaching here in the district and I've just never left. I love the community out here, I love the people out here, and it's just really become my home away from home. What I love the most is the amazing staff and students and family in the community. But our staff is so supportive, so helpful, so thoughtful, always there to meet the needs of other staff members and students. I've been in education for 38 years and it's truly about people. It's truly about the staff that go above and beyond to take care of our kids, to teach our kids, to work with our kids. I have the opportunity to work with teachers who then impact student lives. On the other end of things, I work with administrators that are very supportive. Elementary school, middle school, and high school principals are all there ready to jump in. One of the things that's the most 
The thing I like most about working for Combs is the fact that they invest in their teachers. The district supports me as a teacher with a lot of different things. I feel like having a coach on campus to go to if I have support with something or I have questions and have that coach being able to model and go through some of those things has been very important to me. In the Combs School District, we seek to support our teachers at a variety of levels. We have district-wide professional learning opportunities as well as site professional learning, but we also have a robust instructional coaching staff that supports in a job-embedded manner. So those folks are in working in classrooms with teachers within PLC teams. We even have systems in place for teachers to request support in their classroom, and that might include support within their classroom directly or giving them opportunities to visit and reflect in a peer classroom to see what's happening in there and learn best practices. In my 20 years of education, I've never networked how I do here at Combs with other school districts and teachers across the nation directly that are doing the learning that we're doing, the teaching style that we're doing, sharing ideas, working together. Oh, that's right, because how many words are in the sentence? I would have teachers come here for the home feeling that we have. The people, the students, the families really make it worth working here. Combs is a family and they would be welcomed and valued and heard and we're doing all the right things for kids. And you always have people to encourage you and help you and I've had amazing mentors. I couldn't imagine working for anybody else. We have an incredible benefits package for our staff that our staffs have taken advantage of. We're part of the retirement system in the state of Arizona and we match 100% of the retirement. It's a great opportunity for staff members who want to be a part of that growth. We all have the same goal in mind, is that to help the students become successful. I think the favorite part about working with the staff here is the individuality, the ideas, and the commitment that they have to students. When you work together in that way, it's powerful because it always remains about what's best for the students. It's always been about that ability to make a positive difference in the life of a child and to see our kids grow and to see our staff do the amazing things they do. With you, uh, Kayla, we'll go ahead and share all, all of them with you uh, tomorrow. Uh, as well as the 30 second slots. Um, and so that puts a 13 of them out there. We also have asked for two more. One is a, a hashtag forward for parents so they have a better understanding what hashtag forward and modern learning is all about. And then one is a hashtag forward modern learning for prospective teachers so that they have uh, an idea of what it means uh, uh, coming back in. And it's just a way that can be utilized a, a, ton of, a ton of different ways. We have all the raw footage so we can make additional ones coming up. And, and I know she's not here, but I want to thank Kayla for, for leading this effort. Um, I came up with an idea, but then she asked to actually do something with that idea. And she did an amazing job when you take a look at, at the, what took place with our schools and the way they really tell you a story about our schools. And then when you see these that tell a story about our district and the different things that are happening in our district, we think it's a piece that can be beneficial uh, as we push it out. Again, a uh, number of these are already on our website. Others will be loaded up. Uh, as we speak, some of the 30-second slots would go into like, I know, uh, is it uh, uh, Jake's, whatever the one down there, the uh, Fat Cats, thank you. She knew what I was talking about. Uh, Fat Cats has already got a 30-second piece in for us, so we would put that in. Harkins potentially um, would have one. Uh, we have to look at the value for, for how much they cost. But that's why we did 30-second slots versus two-minute slots, because they can go in a different couple places. So uh, I do want to thank Kayla for all of her work. Uh, possibly there too. Yeah, that's what we're looking at. But we wanted to Pecan make Lake them, and now we can go like ahead and, and push them out. I didn't hear what said. Pecan, Pecan Lakes, Lakes. Uh, the new, the new, the new entertainment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I love the idea. That, yeah, I love the idea. These are on the website. How about putting them on YouTube? Yeah, they're they're on our YouTube. They're, if you go to our YouTube channel, uh, Jail Combs, uh, as part of the YouTube channel, they're yeah, on the YouTube they're channel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They're actually they're already there, but we wanted to kind of launch, and then we'll send okay. them out. But they're there. A yeah. Wider distribution yeah. that yeah. way. They're so there. we need every parent to share it out to family and friends. Yep. That's, Everyone. Yep. That's what we're hoping for. It's required. No, I can't it's require. Required. I'm just kidding. <laughs> can't require, but it should be nice. All right. Part of that thing if they were absent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just just throwing it out there. <laughs> they could do a review. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That brings us 9.7 discussion information of. 2024, 2025.
Joe Comb School District budget. Last but not least. <laughs> we finally got something on the budget in here. Mr. President, members of the board, colleagues, community members, <laughs> ish. Um, this time of year, annual expenditure budgets for the current year and for the next year are everyday topics. I'm sure everyone sitting here is tired of me talking about the budgets. Um, this presentation, though, is to provide you with a quick overview of the budget reporting cycle and the agenda items that I'm going to be bringing to you for review, consideration, and adoption over the next three governing board meetings. I know, you're very excited. <laughs> Bob okay. is. Yeah, Bob is. I'm very <laughs> excited with him. I know he is. Okay, so this is a calendar of events that I took directly from the Uniform Standard of Financial Records. It's also called the USFR. By those of us that have to look at it daily, we call it the USUFFER. Um, for, this is uh, for our Arizona schools and it's published by the Arizona Department of Education and the Arizona Auditor General. In summary, it says the proposed budget has to be out no later than July 5th of each year. By July 15th, the governing board must adopt a proposed budget and we must post by July 18th to the Arizona Department of Education website. By October 15th, we are to bring you an annual financial report that would be based on the prior year, our current school year, um, activity. It's basically a document that summarizes all the financial activity for every single fund for the current school year that we're in now, 23-24. Ironically, we've had to bring you revisions twice a year. We are not required to bring you a revision unless it's dictated by statute. In uh, December, we receive, actually we receive it in November, we receive notification from the Superintendent of Public Instruction that tells us if our adopted budget is in excess of 1% of what ADE says our budget should be. This often happens because we calculate our proposed budget using our free and reduced lunch counts. We include our K-3 reading program. As of December, those two items are usually not identified by ADE. That's why you usually receive this uh, revision in December. Your final revision is due by May 15th, and that is so that you can identify any overages or under underestimations to your budget and that will be your final budget for the school year. So what does that look like for us? May 8th, next meeting, I'm going to bring you the revision number two of this school year's budget. I'll look at any of the changes in our budget lines, lines that we've budgeted money for, maybe we overestimated on some lines, underestimated on others. You notice the report that I load up each, each month, some of the lines will have a negative that's because our estimations were off. We'll be making those corrections when we bring you the May budget. We will also by then have our 100th day ADM. Right now the March reports still project ADM. They have not finalized my ADM yet. Mm -hmm. So the May budget report, revision number two, will have those numbers and those adjustments. And that again makes us meet our May 15th deadline. In June, the following month, I'm going to bring you the proposed budget for next school year. Again, we'll meet the deadline, which is the 15th. And what we will use is all of the data that we have used to calculate the revision number two, and then any changes that we know of. For instance, the base support level for the students, any classroom site fund, we know that change as well. Any projections that we are, we are going to do for next year in our ADM, which we've already talked to you about. Then the following month, I'll be back, and we will have to adopt that proposed budget. That budget must be posted to ADE before July 15th. On October 9th, I'll bring you the annual financial report for the current school year. On December 11th, if we find out we're over by 1%, we receive our budget 25 letter from uh, Superintendent of Instruction, then we will bring you a revision there. On May 14th of 2025, I will be here that night 
asking you for the final revision for the 24-25 school year. And then I will probably walk out and go immediately post it because this has to be posted by May 15th. So that night will be a very busy night. We'll get you to uh, approve the budget, then I'll go get it posted to ADE so we're still in compliance. So you can see there's a lot that has to happen consecutively, getting your signatures, getting everything adopted, posted. It's an ongoing process, but instead of me coming to you every month and telling you here's what I'm gonna bring you next month, we thought we'd do a really quick recap for you um, so that you would just be aware this is what's coming every single month for at least the next three months. Are there any questions? The only other thing I would put up, the only fly in the ointment, so to speak, may be uh, the state budget. Uh, they still haven't really started the negotiations on the state budget. Uh, if you remember last year, it, it ran long into late June, and early July. That kind of throws some of the numbers a little bit. AD usually gives you some, some estimates. So we'll still have to meet those deadlines, but just know that if, if, they, if the state budget doesn't come out, uh, things may get a little a little bit different on that, and they really have not started that negotiation very well yet. I do have a question. Sure. Uh, on June the 12th, the proposed annual expenditure budget is presented for the school year. We've talked in the past, and you've presented to us all the different considerations and things that you're looking at. So you'll at that point, will it be just one look, or will we have some options to consider? I will bring the proposed budget in June. I'm trying to think of how best to get you what you need. I understand what you're saying. Okay. Usually in June, we will tell you this is how we've come to the numbers. Without having the budget forms and having all of the final number, uh, final information that Dr. Wyman just mentioned from the state, in May, I could tell you where we're looking or where I'm looking based on the revision. I could do that for you and give you that so that you would know here's what we're proposing. Typically, we don't have uh, changes between the proposal and the adoption, but there are there are times where the state information will change. Mm -hmm. We don't have the necessary budget forms. There could be some extenuating circumstances, but what I can do in May is bring it to you and say, here's what I'm looking for, here's what the projections are, and what we're forecasting for the proposed budget in June, so that you have that, and then you would know where we were going to be in June for the adoption in July. Right. I would think that, that would be helpful. It doesn't have to be very much in depth, just, right. you know, an overview so we have an understanding of what's going to be coming the following month. Okay. And also, also as we bring the budget recommendations in May, that's going to drive some decision making right. anyway. And so, mm -hmm. so when we say as a, as, a, as a CCC and leadership team, we've decided to go ahead and, and make a recommendation for this salary increase or for this uh, issue or that issue, in some ways the approval of those budget re recommendations in May are gonna drive what the proposed budget is in June and then adopted in July because once you say, yes, we're doing this, we're, we're gonna tell you that we're building this off of this, this amount social. of ADM, right. and then we think with this ADM, we can go ahead and give this raise or not give this raise right. or give this or not give that. And so in some degree, when you do May, it takes some of that out. Um, you could always come back if Miracle Miracles, they gave us more money, which they're not going to, um, and you could do something different, but, but note that as we bring some of the recommendations forward in May, it may drive and answer some of your questions just like uh, Julie okay. was saying. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Any other requests for future agenda items? It's not 8 o'clock yet. We can't leave. Uh, yeah, we can. <laughs> I'll make a motion right now. <laughs> All right. I'll second. <laughs> Are we done with the Yes, so agenda? I'll take a motion to adjourn. All right. So, Shelly, for the first. Shelly's making the motion, okay. Okay, and then Jason, Jason second. seconded. On all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> At 7.54? At 7.54. <laughs> Woohoo! Oh, all in favor? Uh, oh, aye. We, we oh, voted. Yeah. I, I did say that. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. We voted. <laughs> yeah. Whew, I didn't hear it. Okay. No one said.